importantly, is the reaction to the people in this situation, how little they seem to be aware of what's going on and the consequences of what they've done and why they're being visited on them. And kind of the irony that these people will never really change any of their politics politics due to kind of what they're observing, even as it fails in the real world. But before we get into all that, guys, let's go ahead and hear from today's sponsor. Universities today aren't just neglecting real education. They're actively undermining it. And we can't let them get away with it. America was made for an educated and engaged citizenry. The Intercollegiate Studies Institute is here to help. ISI offers programs and opportunities for conservative students across the country. ISI understands that conservatives and right-of-center students feel isolated on college campuses and that you're often fighting for your own reputation, dignity, and future. Through ISI, you can learn about what Russell Kirk called the permanent things, the philosophical and political teachings that shaped and made Western civilization great. ISI offers many opportunities to jumpstart your career. They have fellowships at some of the nation's top conservative publications like National Review, The American Conservative, and The College Thinker. If you're a graduate student, ISI offers funding opportunities to sponsor the next great generation of college professors. Through ISI, you can work with conservative thinkers who are making a difference. Thinkers like Chris Rufo, who currently has an ISI researcher helping him with his book. But perhaps most importantly, ISI offers college students a community of people that can help them grow. If you're a college student, ISI can help you start a student organization or a student newspaper or meet other like-minded students at their various conferences and events. ISI is here to educate the next generation of great Americans. To learn more, go to ISI.org. That's ISI.org. All right, guys. So like I said, I wanted to go ahead and jump into this clip. I'm going to play through different pieces of it, and I'm going to be focusing on some of the connections they make or they don't make as we go. But I think a lot of people are aware of kind of the state that many California regions are in, specifically San Francisco. Of course, uh, the fact that they've decriminalized so many things has had a vast impact on that uh, particular city. It's very clear that the lack of law and order, the unwillingness to take care of uh, kind of just the very basic ins and outs of civilizational maintenance has driven them in a very particular direction. Now, all of these are, of course, implications of progressive policies. They're all kind of the, the eventual fruits that you would expect. But I think it's important from time to time to go back and look at the way that these people themselves are understanding it. We know that San Francisco is having a rough time, but how do the people there understand their problem? Do they see the roots of these things? That's kind of what I want to get into. But let's go ahead and roll again. Remember, but this is this is a CNN. This is not a regional news outlet. Oftentimes you'll have regional news outlets that are more uh, based for for uh, lack of a better term. They're a little more in touch with what's going on They're They're not as interested in the propaganda. So the fact that this story has made it all the way to CNN, it's not on Fox News. It's it's not, uh, you know, Tucker Carlson or Sean Hannity or whoever complaining about how crazy San Francisco is. This is this is on the home base. This, this is on the mothership, right? These are people who are paid to ignore uh, when progressivism kind of goes the wrong way. So it's made if it's made it to CNN, then, you know, things have gotten bad. But let's jump in here real quick. San Francisco businesses fed up with crime. One sandwich shop owner is calling for action after he says he was attacked outside his store. He says he yelled at a man to stop urinating on his trash can and then was sucker punched. His Instagram post about the incident has now gone viral. I'm f***ing fed up with this goddamn city. It's like, I can't just be outside and just running a business without getting punched in the goddamn face. It shouldn't be this way at all. Like, this isn't how our city should be. So there's this average guy, right? He's running, he's running a store. Uh, he just doesn't want homeless people peeing outside of his store all day. That's, that's a pretty basic request. If you had anything like a reasonable law enforcement, they would obviously be uh, out there and uh, punishing people. They'd be, they'd be moving people along for vagrancy. They would make sure that uh, you know, public urination laws were being enforced, those kind of uh, ordinances were being enforced. But of course, that's not happening in San Francisco because it's a city of compassion, right? We have to have compassion for all these people. They're just living another lifestyle. They're, they all don't have the ability to find, uh, you know, housing, those kind of things. Now, obviously, San Francisco is a very expensive city to live in. There, there's a real question as to, you know, what can the average person who's actually working, actually trying to do the right thing, you know, bringing in a middle class income or a working class income, do they, are they able to find housing? Those are all reasonable questions, but that's not the kind of thing that is happening here. We're talking about people who are living lives 
of destitution due to choices they're making because of drugs, alcohol abuse, other types of things that are leading them to go outside. And this guy just wants to operate a store. But of course, the compassion for these people of allowing them to go out and kind of defecate in the streets or urinate in the streets is affecting his ability to just operate a basic business, which means more and more people like him don't want to be there anymore. And you can already see his frustration. I want to get out of here. I can't deal with this anymore. How can we possibly operate a city this way? I'm sure this guy has probably been there for a while. This is probably a place he wants to live. San Francisco used to be a, a beautiful place, well known for its culture, well known for its beautiful scenes. And of course, he wants to be part of that, you know, but of course, but he can't. He can't be there. His business can't operate because the city has chosen these homeless vagrants over him. Him, He is a productive member of society. As a businessman, this has been involved. Now, a lot of people are probably right, get, rightly going to say, well, he voted for this. And you might be right about right. That, that's something to keep in mind as we look at all of these people. A lot of the people who are going to complain about what's happening in their city are all people who went along with the policies that led to this. Now, there, there's a a big problem here. And this is my, my general democracy problem, right? A lot of people are just going to say, well, you voted for this and that's how it is. And to some extent, that's true, right? People making bad decisions, people supporting bad politicians, and then reaping, you know, kind of what is sown there. But you also have to remember that there are conservative people who live in these areas. There are people who disagree with the policies that still live in the area, the area because that's their home. That's where their parents grew up. They have personal connections to that. They don't want to uproot their family. We have to have an understanding that people don't just stay in places because they happen to be politically aligned. Unfortunately, we might be in a place or a country where people start making those decisions 100%. That's kind of where you end up with the great sort. But there are many people sticking it out in these areas because they don't want to be victims. They don't want to be the people who have to move out. They have to uproot their family. They have to destroy their ties to this stuff because they were there. So I, I don't want to just assume that everybody in an era automatic in an area where this stuff is happening automatically supported it but we will see many people who do seem to have that attitude and still don't understand why they're in this predicament not clear what was said before the altercation or whether there's even video of it but san francisco police have said they are investigating it comes as some stores are locking up everything from coffee to frozen food to try to combat theft our kyung law visited one walgreens that's hit by shoplifters more than a dozen times a day it happened three times while she was inside so right here we see uh, th this Walgreens is one of the highest theft uh, zones in the country. It's uh, it's it's one of the stores that is the most victimized by uh, theft, by shrinkage, by uh, shoplifting uh, of any of their stores kind of throughout the United States. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, she said a dozen times a day there. You have to wonder how any business can possibly stay in business when they're having you know 12 or more incidents of shoplifting every single day even while the camera crew is there just in that short time that they are visiting the location there's three incidents of shoplifting obviously this is just a completely untenable situation i'm sure all of you guys have seen the you know this is relatively mild right the, these are relatively mild videos i'm sure many of you have seen like the shoplifting rings that go through a lot of san francisco they just clear out massive stores they come in in large swaths and just take everything uh there's a lot of reasons for that one that many people have focused on and is, is surely a huge factor is that san francisco a lot of people say that they've legalized shoplifting that's not exactly right what they've done is they've turned it into a non-violent misdemeanor uh, as long as it's under $950. That's a much higher number than most places have. And when you make it uh, kind of that casual of a crime, the police don't enforce it. From what, from what I could tell, it looked like the police just uh, never enforce any of these uh, nonviolent misdemeanors. It has to be an arrest on the side of the store itself. And if any of you have ever dealt in retail, if any of you have ever been in these corporate situations, most corporations are very scared to have their employees interact with these people. They know there's a much higher chance that of a lawsuit that will cost them way more money than the theft itself, at least you know, to some extent. If you're getting ripped off for $949 12 times a day, eventually that's got to stack up. But for each individual incident, they know that, hey, a, an employee steps in and stops somebody so that the police will come and get them. All of a sudden, you know, that guy slips, falls or, or you know, has a panic attack or in, anything. You know, re really uh, some kind of emotional distress will probably get you some money. And that lawsuit is going to end up costing them way more than that specific incident. So any attempt to stop this. So while it is 
technically not legal. It has been de facto legalized, which means these people feel more than happy walking in and out of the store with whatever they want at any moment. Richie Greenberg walked into a San Francisco Walgreens when he saw in the frozen food section this. Chains, heavy chains that went from padlock to padlock on both sides of the doors. And this was bizarre, something I'd never seen before. This is just more icing on the cake telling us that rampant crime is, is, has become a, a regular part of life. So so you've got chains all over these freezers, right? The the uh, people are fed up. They go out. Uh, they're they're tired of having everything stolen, and so they're padlocking your basic freezers. Now, I want to talk a little bit about high trust societies. A lot of us grew up in societies that were relatively high trust. You can go down to the corner, and things aren't secure. There's there in many ways there's an honor system. There's some places where a uh, uh, where a gas station attendant or a store owner would feel free to kind of walk away from the counter and, and leave a basket or some kind of honor system for people to pay because they're familiar with the community, right? They know what's going on. Now, part of what builds a high trust society is, of course, just familiarity. And we'll talk about that more here in a little bit. As things scale up, high trust societies get harder. And so when you have a small amount of people in your town, you go to a nice rural town where there's not a lot of crime. Uh, people can be much more casual about many things because they don't have to worry about kind of this constant threat of people they don't know uh, coming in, taking things, uh, disappearing into kind of the crowd of the city. As things get larger, as you have larger metropolitan, metropolitan areas, that kind of fades away. And so then what you're kind of relying on is the is the morality of the people and their social cooperation, the level of trust that they have, the comfort they have with each other. The willingness to see fairness across different groups, they you're counting on the fact that they are willing to continually abide by society's rules so that you can kind of operate uh, your society in a very particular way. The less you can count on people being willing to kind of operate inside that system, the more you have to put these artificial holds. And the, each one of these kind of artificial speed bumps uh, creates a situation where you have less cooperation and therefore less efficiency. So obviously the most efficient thing is I just have open freezers because I don't have to worry about people just stealing things and walking away. And those open freezers allow people to come up and, and take what they need. They can peruse, they can look at something, put it back. I don't have to worry about that as a shop owner because the people inside there are abiding by the rules of a high trust society. And so therefore it's not really my problem that I have to run around watching each one of these people and what they do. On top of that, and that means that my employees have more time to do other things inside the store because it's not their job to walk from each different freezer, each different case, unlock each one of these things. That means that I have a higher level of efficiency inside of my society, inside of my specific business, because I can trust that the people coming into my store are going to abide by a specific type of rule. They're going to have a specific type of culture, a different a specific type of community that allows us to have that trust between each other. But obviously in San Francisco, that is no longer the case. They can no longer trust that basic low dollar food items can be left out in the open because those who frequent those stores no longer abide by those, uh, uh, those kind of uh, communal morals. So typical that in the 30 minutes we were at this Walgreens, <laughs> We watched three people, including this man, steal. Did that guy pay? Did that guy pay? He didn't pay. Now, of course, yeah, this guy walks out of here, and uh, that, that shouldn't be surprising at all. He just grabs something off the shelf and walks out. But, of course, CNN is protecting his identity, right? The, the guy just committed a crime. It's their job to report the news. Everybody who's on there... Uh, you know, talking about the crime, all of their faces are out there, but this guy is covered up. Now, maybe there's some kind of uh, liability issue or they, they think maybe, but that's kind of part of it too, right? Is the, the laws are there to protect the guilty, not the innocent at this point. The laws are there to protect the, uh, the, the, the thief and not the victim. The people who are getting things stolen from them, they're on camera, they're out in the open. They have to worry about lawsuits. They have to worry about policy. They have to worry about media blowback. The guy who's doing the crime, he doesn't have to worry about any of that stuff up to the point where CNN will blur out his identity to make sure that there's no fallout for what he just did. 
Walgreens says this Richmond neighborhood store with aisles of products like mustard locked behind plexiglass has the highest theft rate of all their nearly 9,000 U.S. stores hit more than a dozen times a day. So higher, highest of all of their 9,000 stores. You see, it's not, you know, you can understand medicine, this kind of thing. Maybe that can be used, turned into drugs. They're locking away mustard, right? They're locking away $2 containers of mustard. That's how bad their theft is. The theft isn't even targeted at items that could be high dollar value or could be converted directly into some kind of, you know, a drug, uh, you know, used for drugs, used, used for these kind of things, getting high. It, it's anything. Anything that isn't nailed down has to be kind of uh, locked behind this plexiglass. Now, a lot of people have focused, you'll see these, these stories all the time about things like, oh, food deserts or book deserts or, you know, whatever, the, the, the new term of uh, deserts on the left. And what they're talking about is that all the stores that would service these things, all the stores that would provide, uh, you know, fresh foods or would provide reading materials or the kind of things that are, that are kind of good for a community that they need to kind of do well and prosper, they all go away right? They all leave. And this is always treated as some kind of evil capitalist thing. You know, people who are, uh, you know, don't, don't want to be in these neighborhoods anymore because they don't make enough money or whatever, or they just don't hate, you know, they hate people of a specific group. But what we can see is that these deserts make themselves, right? Many of these, uh, these retail agencies are leaving, these, uh, these retail businesses are leaving because of the amount of theft, the amount of violence, the amount of loss that they are encountering. This Walgreen is got everything locked down, right? Every bit of it is locked down. Every, you, you saw how you see how everything is behind plexiglass and they're still getting shoplifted 12 times a day. 12 times, even though everything is locked down. How can that business maintain profitability? You have to have everything locked down. You have to have people, you know, uh, the, the people who work there, the employees have to constantly go and unlock everything every time that someone wants to purchase anything. And even with all of that additional level of security, they still they still are losing that much product. How are you going to maintain profitability? You're not. And if you can't maintain profitability, you're just going to leave. And if everybody leaves due to what is happening in an area that it's gone from high trust to low trust, right, then who's it, who's going to blame? Is it going to be the, the politicians who created the policies? Is it going to be the people who perpetrated the crimes? No, it's going to be the businesses. It's going to be the business owners. It's going to be based on, based on some kind of systemic racism or something. That'll be the, uh, yeah, that, that'll be the line here. Maybe not here in San Francisco that that population's, uh, you know, uh, still, still pretty pale, I guess in general, but, uh, but this is going to be the storylines that kind of come out of why these businesses leave, but we can see if, you know, they, there doesn't need to be any kind of bias. There doesn't need to kind of, kind of systemic, uh, you know, issue here, other than the fact that the people of that city and the politicians that are in charge of that city have decided that they no longer want civilization to function. And when that happens, people leave and they go to places where that's not happening. It's really that simple. When thieves turned to cleaning out ice cream and frozen burritos, workers grew so frustrated they resorted to the chains. They were ordered down by corporate because of the negative messaging. So hear that, right? The, the, the employees take it on themselves. This is not an order from corporate. It's the employees who are fed up with watching this happen because it's them day in and day out. And, and this is something that doesn't get talked about enough, okay? A lot of people say, well, this is just a corporation. And I'm with you. Walgreens is probably, I don't, I don't know enough about Walgreens, so I, I'm not going to just uh, assume everything about it. But corporations of that size are usually pretty woke. They're, they're usually very progressive. Uh, I would not be surprised at all if Walgreens supports all of the things that are kind of leading up to what's happening here. So I'm not letting Walgreens off the hook here. I'm not saying they're the good guys here at all. That's not what I'm saying. And I don't even really care that they're losing money or that, you know, that whatever, like they're a massive corporation. Again, they're, they're probably not exactly, uh, you know, right wing. So maybe they're just getting what they deserve. That's, that's fine. Whatever. The point is that in a community where this stuff is regularly happening, people become demoralized. People lose their sense of self-respect. They lose their sense of community. They lose the sense that, that there's anything fair. The people who are working at that Walgreens for what I'm sure is not a huge amount of money have to watch all these people walk in and take everything out of that store for free without getting any kind of penalty. And they're thinking, what kind of sucker am I to sit here and work and earn money 
to feed my family, to pay my rent, to buy the things I want from a store when I walk into it, right? They're, they're probably there buying things that they need from their family from the store they work at while people who just come in and steal it go out with no issue. And that is something that destroys people on a very fundamental level. And so it is the employees, not the corporation, that go out and buy these chains to lock this up. And if you've ever been, again, in these retail jobs, do you know this? Because I remember that this isn't a new issue. I remember I had a bunch of friends who worked at a clothing store when I was in high school, and they had theft rings come in all the time. And they knew uh, that they would come in and steal just thousands of dollars worth of clothes. And there was nothing they could do about it. Even the guys who were specifically in loss prevention, as is the corporate speak for it, right? Shrinkage. Even though they were in the job of stopping these people, they, they had no ability to do anything. They weren't allowed to do anything. They weren't even allowed to stand between them and the door. All they could do is follow these people around and, and say, please stop doing that. That's it. That's all they could do. And then they left. And eventually my friends just left that job because it was so demoralizing constantly have to sit there and pretend like nothing was going on. And again, this was not in a very particularly liberal area, not a very particularly liberal state. That was just the corporation's policy. And this was decades ago. It's only gotten worse. And of course, when you have cities like San Francisco that are actively forcing these kind of policies onto businesses, then they make decisions like this. So the, the employees go out and they try to get uh, chains to stop what's going on here. And it's corporate that says, no, we can't have chains on our freezers because of the message it sends. Well, it doesn't matter what the message is. This is happening. This is what's necessary. Now, maybe they thought that the message was, this is an unsafe place to shop and they don't want to send that message. But people probably could figure that out because you have 12 or more shoplifting uh, lifting incidents a day happening inside your store. And they're probably more worried about the, you know, the message it sends about them not trusting these people who walk in but they're not going to do anything. They're not going to change the way that they vote. They're not going to change the people they support. They're not going to change their politics, even though they know that this is actively happening. This is actively destroying their ability to do business. None of this impacts the way that large corporations think about what they're doing. That's a dangerous set of incentives because they know the perception that they are fighting back against stuff is against this stuff is worse than just being stolen from constantly. It's an incredibly dangerous way to run a city, a business, or a nation. But Walgreens isn't the only retailer impacted in San Francisco. You have to ask an employee for help. At this store, frozen food is controlled with a cable lock, fake eyelashes locked behind plexiglass, along with lotion and nail polish. At another grocery store, $14 bags of coffee under lock and key. What is this? Um, I so this is an amazing moment right here. Um, you'll, you'll notice, of course, she's going through all these other stores, not, not just the Walgreens, but all these other stores in the area. All of them have everything locked down. I want you to take a, a, a look at the flags here. Look at, look at this row of flags. Um, if you had American flags lined up like this, this, this would probably terrify, uh, San Franciscans. Uh, the liberals would, would be terrified at that, that display kind of display of patriotism but this is this is not the old flag of america this is the new flag uh but let, let's hear uh what he has to say here because it's quite funny i don't know i don't understand why coffee I don't oh know, here she is but oh it's, <laughs> it's become kind of like a police state in san francisco <laughs> i don't know how to describe it so the funny thing in here is his he just doesn't know right he just doesn't know what is happening he, he can't fathom why all of this stuff is locked up he does there there's no you know there's no causality this is my favorite thing that that there there was no steps before this there were no steps before this there was no slippery slope there were no kind of uh different lines crossed it all just suddenly happened right and and of course he calls it a police state because everything is locked behind glass which is funny because of course that's like supposed to be exactly the opposite of what's going on here right they wanted to get rid rid of police interference they wanted to get rid of the need for police to step in and all this stuff it was the policing that was the problem right police uh you know uh hassling uh these disadvantaged communities the these different people who are involved in drugs and alcohol these vagrants uh be, it was because the police were involved with this that was the problem and so uh they they all wanted to get rid of the police defund the police right it's all the police that are that are causing this issue but now 
that there uh, are no police enforcing these laws, all of a sudden we have a police state because now it's important for all of us to have these private uh, the, you know, intermediaries, all these, now that the public law enforcement is gone, it becomes to each business to start locking everything down and restricting people's access. And so what actually brings this kind of police state feel is not some, you know, jackbooted thug, you know, going through uh, and, and stopping people from shoplifting in San Francisco. It's the lack of anyone willing to stop what's going on, the lack of anyone willing to enforce it, right? That That's what actually brings about this issue. It's not part of city life. It's not part of the way people should be living, right? And that includes folks who are committing the crimes. Marjan Phil so it, it obviously has become a part of city, uh, city life. And you, you have to ask why. Now, it's not that we don't understand what stops crime. That's the funny thing about this. It's, it's the same thing with education, right? We, we know what works. We know what, what works for people. We're familiar. It's not that we don't have the social science or we don't have the data or we don't just have the common sense established after you know, hundreds or thousands of years of human nature. We know how to stop crime. We know what stops it. We're just choosing not to. And that's what's really amazing here is, is the, that everything that's happening here is a choice. Because the people involved here are so heavily invested in progressive ideology, they refuse to make those very basic connections. They refuse to go ahead and acknowledge that. You guys have, I'm sure, heard of broken windows policing, right? This is famously one of the reasons that Rudy Giuliani was able to clean up uh, New York. Some people, you know, of, of course, contest that. But it's not just New York. There are many different places where broken windows policing works. We understand that small property crimes lead to magnification of larger crimes, right? And so if you stop enforcing those small laws, then the big things come next. This is just another application of, of what's famously called Chesterton's fence, right? You don't want to take down, uh, G.K. Chesterton said, you don't want to take out a fence until you know what's on the other side of it, why that fence was established in the first place. And that's kind of just progressivism in a nutshell, is we're going to take down every fence just because it's a fence. Not, not because we care about society, not because we care about what that fence was might have been holding back, but because every fence can only and ever have been constructed by oppressive white Christian patriarch or blah, 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 whatever, right? These are, these are the only things, the only reason any restriction has ever been placed on society. Otherwise, everyone just would live in this kind of amazing utopia. But because we have these fences, because we have these things blocking what we're doing, uh, you know, they, ha they have to be dismantled just because they're there. But of course, as this happens, as each one of these fences gets taken down, uh, you start with something small, seems insignificant. It's not a big deal. Who really cares if someone gets busted for, for you know, chewing gum or, or or candy bar or whatever, you know, theft, that's not a big deal. And you go all the way up to $950 and all of a sudden, none of your stores can operate. You have massive shoplifting rings going on. You have, uh, you're enabling a lifestyle of vagrancy and, and, uh, and drug use uh, because you're basically subsidizing all these people because they can just shoplift everything they want uh, to pay for their drugs and to feed themselves. Uh, constantly, you've created an ecosystem that could not possibly exist if you're operating a real society, a high trust society. It can only exist because you've created this artificial kind of metropolis in which people can obtain all this free stuff at the cost of law abiding citizens. And so you you know what's we know what's happening here. We know it works. There's a lot of controversy uh, with kind of the president of El Salvador right now, right? He locked up like all these gangs. And he's wildly pop, pop, uh, popular inside his own country. There's no controversy there. There's there, there these gangs. They were murdering everybody. They had an insane murder rate. He incarcerated everybody with a gang tattoo and the murder rate tank, right? A lot of people didn't like that because it violates civil rights, that kind of thing. I'm not endorsing him one way or another. I'm simply saying this is the debate that's happening right now around what he did. A lot of people get very angry about what happened there outside the U.S., but the people who are living inside of it, they're not angry because they're not getting stabbed anymore. They're not getting shot in random drive-bys. So it's not like we don't understand what need, what could fix the situation. And you don't need anything anywhere near as drastic as El Salvador. You don't even need to violate anyone's rights of, of any kind. You just need to endure, enforce basic law and order. But of course, that enforcement of basic law and, for, law and order is often treated as itself a violation of rights because unfortunately, there's disproportionately uh, you know, uh, groups that do different amount of crime and the, the enforcement of those laws will disproportionately then fall on groups that are more likely to be committing that crime in the first place. And so it will then be viewed through that lens. 
This is just a constant problem that anyone working in law enforcement is very aware of. If you talk to anyone in law enforcement, especially after the summer of George Floyd, the, the 2020 BLM riots, they know that there are just many uh, calls they don't respond to in neighborhoods they don't police because policing them is too dangerous to their career. It's too dangerous because they're going to they're, they're gonna get sued. They're going to get uh, a new story is going to happen. Something's going to destroy them. And so it's just best to sit in the cruiser and wait for the next call. And so the people who get policed are kind of the law-abiding citizens. This, this is the anarcho-tyranny, right? You're only policing the people that you can get away with policing, which is kind of the, the law-abiding citizens. Uh, you, you terrorize them more while allowing a lot of this low-level crime to continue. Our mom of three small business and community advocate says these visible problems in her city are leading to renewed activism driven by residents like the recall of the city's district attorney last year. I think what we've seen, uh, especially in the past couple of years, is less tolerance, more exasperation. So, I mean, you hear, you hear from her, you know, less tolerance, right? More exasperation, more people willing to do things. Uh, less focused on, uh, you know, implementing the progressive social agenda, more interested in letting law and by law abiding citizens carry on with their day. She says, look, we, you know, we worked to get rid of this DA, which we know is a huge part of many of these issues. District attorneys who are unwilling, uh, even when the, when we have these kind of ridiculous uh, uh, ceilings on kind of, or floors rather on kind of where prosecution will take place, we'll still ignore those prosecutions. We'll still let people off with, with really light sentences. Uh, you know, very liberal DAs, George Soros funded DAs. I don't know if the specific one was George Soros funded, but likelihood is probably pretty good. Uh, you know, th these are a huge problem throughout the United States and uh, communities have to be willing to take action. And as liberal as the people of San Francisco are, as much as they're bought into much of this kind of progressive claptrap, when it comes to their own hometown and it being devastated, they're willing to, to kind of put some of that aside, put that ideology aside and kind of take action. You know, there, there's a couple old jokes that come to mind. Yeah, neoconservative is a liberal that got mugged. Uh, and, and that's certainly something that's probably happening to some degree in San Francisco. But also, of course, conquest's first law. Everybody is most conservative about what they know best. Uh, you, you might be progressive on some large grand scale for things far away from you that don't affect you. But close to home, you're conservative because it's actually something you love, something you care about and more movement to action by everyday San Franciscans to change how their city is run. It's not enough right now, but there is a change, and I think ultimately we will get there. San Francisco City Supervisor Matt Dorsey, former police spokesman and recovering drug addict, sees the rampant shoplifting as a systemic problem. From yeah, it, it, even your city officials are recovering drug, drug addicts, but here we are. Uh, anyway, let's let's hear this again. It's a, it's a systemic issue. From city leaders to an understaffed police force to the fentanyl crisis. When you're seeing that level of retail theft, that tends to be subsistence level retail theft. People, people are, who are hungry. People are. So here you hear it, right? Like even even in this situation, as dire as, as these things can be, as bad as shape as San Francisco can be in, this is about people being hungry. Now, to, you know that's what they're saying. It's it's subsistence level theft. Now, to be clear, I'm sure that many of these people stealing are hungry at some point, but it's because they spent their money on drugs, right? That's the fentanyl. They say it right before that. The fentanyl crisis. People are living on the street. Uh, they, they, they need money to score drugs, and they're using any money they can to score drugs. Probably many of the stolen products that they're, uh, they're stealing are traded for money uh, or for drugs directly. And then they're also stealing the food that they need to eat. And because... Uh, San Francisco has created the situation where there's basically no penalty for all of this low grade theft uh, that it subsidizes. It actively subsidizes through these corporations and local businesses, these drug habits. These people don't have to figure out what to do. They don't have to get clean. They don't have to go through treatment programs. They don't, you know, none of that has to happen because there's this constant stream of easily available income that no one's ever going to stop them. No one's ever going to stop them and, and make them go to prison, you know, clean themselves up, uh, go, go through a treatment program. There's never going to be that intervention because there's this constant ability to reach in and get that. But of course, that's not the problem, right? It's, 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 it's all about hunger. It's subsistence level theft. Now, I'm sure it's not just subsistence level theft, because again, once you get in the situation, once you're a working person, you're a working class person, you're working in one of these retail, uh, you know, uh, stores and you watch people continuously walk out with everything that you are going to spend your hard earned money 
to buy. I mean, how many retail employees are making 950 bucks a day? None of them, right? None, none, none of them are even in, even in San Francisco, they're making $950 a day, but you could steal $949 worth of stuff and not have to worry about actually getting arrested. So what kind of sucker is working for $15 an hour at Walgreens actually having to ring up cash registers and fill freezers and throw freight and, uh, you know, go open up each one of these things when you could just steal that mo way more money than you're making out of a store every day and very likely never face any kind of penalty. And so eventually even good people, even people who would never you know, want to live a life like these people who are subsistence level theft you know, going on, they, they would never want to live the kind of life that they're living. They still eventually have to look at what's going on and say, well, what kind of idiot am I that I am putting in this kind of hard work while these people are getting a free pass on everything that they're doing? That's just ridiculous. But of course, they don't notice any of this. You also see uh, someone's saying, uh, Oren's making a good place. I'm moving to San Francisco. See you later, boys. Yeah, if you're a pirate, this is this is certainly the place to be. If you you, you could live on 950 bucks a day easy, uh, I guess, in retail theft there if, if you really wanted to. Uh, but yeah, uh, to be clear, he also said, well, our police department is understaffed. Well, why is it understaffed? Well, they've been pushing to defund the police, so that's probably a big part of it. They've also, the people who are in the police are being demoralized. Again, they know that they're being painted as the bad guys. Uh, they don't want to interact with the wrong group. They don't want to get caught on social media. They don't want to get destroyed, have their lives destroyed uh, by a kind of a, a media apparatus that is constantly looking to make them the bad guys and to make the uh, the criminal kind of the victim. And they don't want to be involved in, in getting sued. These are all things that you know, are going to impact your police rates. So, of course, your police are understaffed. They're hungry. There is a level of addiction playing out in many parts of our city. It's happening at levels we really haven't seen in San Francisco. What I'm hearing from my residents and what I'm hearing from San Franciscans is it's time for tough love. We are not doing any addict in this city favors by enabling behavior that is potentially deadly in ways we have never seen. And again, you, you can kind of see what, what's going on here. Uh, liberals finally understand kind of the consequences of their policies. They kind of understand where these things naturally lead. And there's some amount of pushback. Uh, th this is this is the ratchet turning, right? You you this is where you get a Reagan. This is where you get a Giuliani. This is where you get somebody to step in and kind of quell the madness for a while to kind of hold back the madness. But at the same time, this is where a lot of this stuff gets locked in because yeah, you need somebody to kind of step in for a while and kind of put the the, the craziness away for a little bit. But while that happens, a lot of what what uh, advanced during that time gets normalized. It looks like there's a conservative backlash. It looks like people are learning their lessons. But what we really see is this is a cycle because, of course, New York went from Giuliani to then a bunch of liberal mayors uh, over a uh, increasingly liberal and progressive mayors over time. Their crime rates have gone back up, right? The, the, these gains, these these kind of stops uh, in the crime rate, these pushbacks in the crime rate eventually catch back up because the lessons are not ultimately learned. And that's the big thing I want to take away from you know, from this. That's the big thing I want us to focus on is, yes, some of these people in San Francisco, some of the mayors, so, you know, or the, the mayors, city councilmen, uh, sheriffs, uh, so, some of the community activists, they might in a moment, you know, once they're in the, the worst parts of what's going on, say to themselves, well, this doesn't work. And we have to we have to dial this back a little bit. And so there'll be a little bit of backlash, a little bit of course correction. But none of these people are going to fundamentally change the way they vote. They're never going to fundamentally change their politics, even though they're watching their civilization fall apart real time. Even they're having to step over homeless encampments and drug addicts and the, the, you know, the feces on the street, people urinating right next to their store. They can't walk into the store and buy anything because everything's locked up. You know, the, the, all, even though all this stuff is happening, that's not going to change the way they vote. They're never going to make the connection between their political uh, preference, their political uh, orientation, and the actual societal decline they're seeing. Think about what he said there. Fentanyl, right? We have a fentanyl epi epidemic, right? Well, why do you have a fentanyl epidemic? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is you are literally subsidizing fentanyl use through your unwillingness to enforce basic laws. It, it, not, not just the, the theft laws, though that is a huge part of it, but the fact that you're just letting people do this stuff out in public, live on the streets, you are creating a situation where, oh, we're not, we're not uh, arresting homeless people, we're not rousing them, we're not bothering them, 
because they could be victims. Well, they could be. Or because you're creating a safe space for people to indulge their worst possible vices, they're actually just indulging them more. This is a possibility that just never seems to kind of exist for the left, never exists for progressives, that that allowing people a space in which to do this kind of thing makes more of it, not reduces it and, and, and increases the safety. But the other thing is that they're never going to address the fact that the fentanyl is coming over the border, right? That so much of this fentanyl is available at the prices it is and is, and is as dangerous and potent as it is because it's coming into the country illegally. But that's not going to stop them. They're not going to close the border. They're not going to stop their support for open borders. They're not going to stop being sanctuary cities. They're not going to stop calling anybody who wants to, to, to stop kind of this horrible abuse of Americans through the border. Uh, they're not going to stop calling them racist or xenophobes or, or uh, you know, wh whatever. They are going to continue to hold all of those political priors. And then they're going to just complain slowly as each, each piece of this gets broken down. Now, the richest of the rich don't have to live like this. I'm sure the city councilman there, he's probably not in many of the neighborhoods that are worst affected by this. Nice thing about being uh, a very rich liberal is you can avoid the consequences for a very long time of the very policies you espouse. But again, this is the problem with this, with this high trust society becoming low trust. When you scale up society to large cities, you need to have a shared morality. You need to have a shared culture. You need to have a shared understanding. You need to have high trust between each people so that you don't have to worry about one group making victims of another or a bunch of people who think that they're entitled to uh, you know, corporations, uh, you know, ice cream and eyelashes and, and uh, you know, all this other you know, coffee that they're locking away just so they can subsidize their drug habit. You have to have some kind of basic level of uh, morality and understanding and cultural cohesion, social fabric, if you're going to operate a society at this level. It's easier when you're smaller, when you have smaller uh, groups together, it's easier to operate these things. But as you scale up, you have to have this basic level because if you don't, then things quickly devolve. And that's what we're seeing here because there's no shared trust, because there's no shared morality, because there's no shared value, because there's a lot of incentive in breaking down fences, breaking down barriers, destroying, applying civilizational acid, kind of all of these things that would normally stop this cultural and social degradation, civilization comes apart. And that's really what we're seeing in, in, in uh, San Francisco. Um, a lot of people ask, uh, how do we turn this around? And the answer is, we might not. Uh, the, the, as you can see, many people in this video did not understand where this came from, why it was happening. There was one lady, she understood, right? She said, okay, community activists, we got to get together. We got to get rid of this DA. We need tough love. We, you know, we have to, okay. So there, there is some level of awareness with some people, but are they going to change what they support? Are they really going to understand the deeper truths encoded in kind of their discovery that crime is bad and kind of slowly destroys the the city that them and their family are living in? Are they going to go beyond that surface level of just do something about crime for 10 years until I forget about it and it all snaps back again? Or are they going to make lasting and permanent changes to the way that they do things? The answer is they probably won't. Uh, and that, and again, that's why so many more people are moving with their feet, voting with their feet than with their ballot at this point, because uh, the tide has just become overwhelming in many places in San Francisco. Uh, you're not just going to go run some law and order Republican in San Francisco and then, then suddenly uh, kind of turn the whole city around. That's just not where they're at. They're, they're going to keep driving deeper in to this ideological black hole because they don't connect their policy with the actual consequences. Uh, that said, guys, uh, let's go ahead and move over here to the questions of the people. we got a few stacking up. Let's see, Creeper Weirdo here for $5. Thank you very much. Uh, don't approach the thief. Let them escape and hope you get to see their license plate. Call the police and describe the theft corporate answer. Yeah, that is the, you're exactly right. That's the, the most common corporate answer. It's the one I got when I worked in low level retail jobs. It's the one my friends got when they worked in low level retail jobs. Uh, it never works. It never really deters uh, any of this theft. And uh, the, and at this point, the police don't want to chase after those leads because uh, you know, for all the reasons we already kind of mentioned, because uh, they're, they're going to end up being the bad guys. They're going to put themselves, no, no police officers going to risk getting uh no police officer is going to risk getting uh losing their job getting fired getting publicly destroyed just so they can go ahead and uh you know 
bust some guy who picked up, you know, $50 in ice cream. That's just not going to happen. Uh, Jake Bowen here for $5. Would you consider having Paul Vanderclay on again to talk about what he's up to, uh, the dying modern paradigm, and to explain Scott Mayan esque stuff? stuff. Yeah, no, I love Paul Vanderclay. Uh, it's been a while since I've checked in on his channel, though, so I'm not sure exactly what he's up to at the moment, what you're referencing there. Uh, but I've had Paul on two times already, and I would love to have him on a third. Actually, I want to ask Paul about community. He said something very interesting uh, to, uh, to, to someone I was watching when he was being interviewed. He said, uh, most people don't want community. Most people think they want community, but they're not willing to make the sacrifice, which uh, I think is something very interesting, considering what we just watched. Maybe at some point, things do get bad enough where people are able to make the sacrifice, but maybe Paul's right and we're not there yet. So yes, I would I would be happy to have Paul on again. I will most assuredly uh, try to get him on the schedule. Uh, Dreadnought here for $5. I love the way that CNN makes it sound like the major problem is locking things up rather than why have they, they have been locked up. Yes, exactly so, right? Same thing with the guy who says, oh, San Francisco has turned into a police state and I don't understand what happened, right? The main issue is not that people are stealing things. The main issue is not that we have incentivized people to steal things. The main issue is not all of the social forces that have driven us to allow all of this stuff and create these incentives. The only problem is all of a sudden chains showed up on my freezer or I have to sit around and wait for someone to unlock my coffee and I don't like that. It feels like a police state. Again, it's just a complete disconnection from the consequences of policy, of certain worldviews, of certain understandings of human nature and the actual costs that occur. That There's no civilization for the left, societies for the left just sprang out of nowhere. They, they just, they are the natural state. Uh, everyone would live, you know, th this is Rousseau, right? You'd be free, but everywhere and you're, you're in chains. M man would normally just live in this kind of perfect communist utopia where everyone had what they needed and everything is perfect. And it's only because society twists people and makes them greedy and, and, and forces all these systemic uh, inequalities onto them that you actually uh, end up with, with anything else, except obviously that's not the case. Uh, but, but they can't see that because if they made that connection, that, that connection is so dangerous. That pattern recognition is so dangerous because if they notice the pattern, if they notice what was happening, they notice why it was happening. They'd have to completely reevaluate the worldview. And many of these people have their position in society staked inside that worldview. Right. They're, they're not just they're not just ignoring these things because they, they got the message from school or whatever or from the media, though. That's a big part of it. A lot of these people are kind of worthless, you know, HR reps or something. And if they if the whole system comes apart, they lose their status as well. So, yeah, they're they're a little miffed that they have to wait for somebody to come unlock their coffee. And they don't like that someone's peeing outside of their apartment, but they'd never be able to afford the coffee or the apartment if they weren't being artificially uh, elevated themselves by the system. And so they are literally incentivized monetarily to ignore these kind of more obvious connections. Creeper Weirdo again for $2. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, yeah, criminals. Why do we need this Dread guy? Yeah, I, I, I love the uh, the new uh, Judge Dread movie. I call it the new Judge Dread movie. It's like a decade all, old at this point. What I mean is, it's newer than the Sylvester Stallone movie. Uh, but I like I like both of the Judge Dread movies. I never read the comic books. I know they were they were kind of uh, popular comic books. Uh, but but I do enjoy both of those movies for different reasons. Uh, the 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 uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger one, or sorry, the uh, Sylvester Stallone one is obviously incredibly cheesy. And which I do love. And then uh, the, the newer one with Carl Urban is itself pretty good. All right. Uh, Evan M here for 10 Canadian. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry about Canada. Uh, we, we supported funding the police when other people had to deal with the rise in, or sorry, we supported defunding the police when other people had to deal with the rise in crime, but the crime started rising in San Francisco. That was just a step too far. Yes. Again, that complete disconnection from kind of the obvious consequences. They want to shout a slogan in the moment when it makes them feel good, when they see it on TV, uh, when, when there's this energy in the room, when uh, they're being fed this kind of line about inequality and, and, and victimhood and all these things. They want to chant this line. They, it, people stop, people talk to them and say, obviously this is insane. Obviously this is going to have huge ramifications. We can't do this. They ignore them because they want to feel like they're the good guy. They're on the side of the right side of history. They're the ones who are going to be seen as tolerant people, the good people, right? But then when the consequences come, then when then when the obvious, uh, you know, uh, kind of payment comes due, all of a sudden 
I don't know what happened. Oh, we can't have this. Blah, 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 blah. Right. And, and they're a big surprise. And they bring in someone who's quasi responsible to fix this problem for them again for like five years until they forget the lesson. And we start the cycle all over again. It's a, it's a vicious cycle that unfortunately is, uh, is kind of subsidized by our current level of societal safety and societal wealth. But as you can see, uh, eventually th that, that surplus goes away. Eventually places like San Francisco eat through that incredible wealth, that, uh, that surplus safety, that, that decadence that allowed them to kind of uh, pretend like these basic functions of society didn't need to be enforced anymore. And eventually that comes due. Unfortunately, the results are horrific. Uh, I don't want to be there when those things happen. I don't want my family to be there. I don't want, I don't want that to happen to people I know and love. Uh, but, but it, it seems to some extent like it might be unavoidable. Pe people have to have to, the, until those comforts are removed, they simply will not understand the lesson. And uh, you can see that in San Francisco because that's already happening. You already see the victimization. You already see the, the criminalization. Uh, you already see what's going on there. Uh, and there's still just people standing around baffled saying, I don't know. I don't know what happened. How did this turn into a police state? It's exactly a problem. Peter Mazza here for ten dollars. Uh, thank you, Pete. Looks like that was just a uh, a donation, no question. But thank you very much. I really appreciate your support. And uh, Dreadnought here again. A neo Russoian man is born free, but everywhere his freezers are in chains. That's a good. That's a good one, man. I like that. Every man is born free, but everywhere his freezers are in chains. Uh, you you should. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna steal that out. Uh, I'm going to steal that, put that on Twitter later. Uh, I'll, I'll shout you out when I do that. If you got a Twitter handle, let me know and I'll, I'll tag you in it, man. Well done. That's a, that's really good. I like that a lot. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up, but thank you everybody for coming by. Of course, if this is your first time here, please make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, when you do that, uh, uh, go ahead and turn on the notifications. I've been hearing people say that they're not getting notified. Unfortunately, YouTube is stupid. Uh, when you subscribe, they don't know that that means you actually want to watch a video, especially if someone's a conservative or a right winger, they suppress it even more. Uh, so if you want to make sure you're seeing my stuff when it goes live, uh, make sure that you go ahead and not just subscribe, but you actually do the notifications, hit the bell, all that stuff uh, to make sure that you know what's going on. And of course, if you want to watch uh, this show on, uh, if you or sorry, if you want to listen to this show, if you just want to listen to it as a podcast, you can subscribe to the Orm McIntyre show on your favorite podcast platform. When you do that, make sure that you leave a rating or review that helps with all the algorithm magic. And of course, uh, I have a lot of people notice I was supposed to have uh, Daryl Cooper from Martyr Maid on today. Uh, he had to move it to tomorrow, but we will be going live at 3 p.m. tomorrow. I'm very excited about that. Daryl is a very smart guy. Some people disagree on some stuff, I understand, but I think it's it's mostly because Daryl tells some, some, tr some very tough truths to, to people on the left, but also to people kind of on, on the right as well. And so we're going to, we're going to dive into a whole bunch of stuff. I'm really looking forward to that. been trying to put that together for a long time. So don't miss that. I'll see you guys tomorrow at 3 PM. Thanks for coming by. I'll talk to you then.